next webinar series. And do stay tuned. We'll we'll announce a, a, a fall series soon. But it, I'm pleased to be able to introduce Steve Banwert today. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Steve. Um, he's he's a professor and the integrating chair in soil, water, and agricultural resources at the University of Leeds. Steve was raised on a farm in Iowa, and he got his BS in civil engineering and MS in environmental engineering at the University of Iowa before he went to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and gained his PhD in natural and environmental science. He has a very long list of activities and distinctions, but for this audience today, I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, one is that he was the co-I of the Soil Crit Zone project, which was meant to gather uh, European critical zone scientists just to get organized and bring them all together. It included some American scientists also. He was then the principal investigator of the Soil Trek project, soil transformations across European catchments, which established uh, four CZOs and some satellite sites throughout Europe. That project is now uh, completed. He is now the U UK principal investigator on enhancing soil fertility and ecosystem services for peri-urban agricultural in China, which is one of five CZOs funded through a joint effort by the UK and China. And he's also the PI on a UK-China program of coordination. And interestingly, I haven't talked to you about this yet, but commercialization feasibility study. So I'm really uh, pleased to be able to count Steve as a colleague and a friend, and I'm really happy that he was willing to present today on policy relevance of critical zone science, and I'm also glad you're willing to stay awake and be at home and present to us anyway. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. That's a, a very kind introduction. It's exciting for me to uh, participate in the uh, National CZO Program 2017 webinar series. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to this group. My topic is policy relevance of critical zone science. I'm gonna just go through some of the background that I think is gonna be familiar to critical zone science everywhere, which is the role of Earth's critical zone and uh, in, in seeking solutions to major global societal challenges. The area where I've worked at at the science policy interface is on soil resources in Europe. So I'll talk a little bit about that and the examples from the soil truck project. I'm gonna talk about at the end, the policy pull, especially for uh, international policy for critical zone research. And I wanna acknowledge um, the past funding of the European Commission on the soil truck project and the current funder, which is the Newton Fund in the UK of the NERC National Science Foundation of China Critical Zone Observatory Program. Um, we know from basic research opportunities in earth sciences, one, the NRC report of 2001, this importance of the critical zone in regulating natural habitat and determining the availability of life-sustaining resources. And I think that statement about the availability of life resources actually from the very beginning placed critical zone science uh, facing towards policy, and in addition to that, this is policy that's informed by great knowledge being generated from fundamental science and applied science. But clearly, the, the, the driver, uh, and, and it's in the name, is that Earth's critical zone is critical, and it's critical for the survival of humanity. And in addition to this, there is this statement that's in that same report from 2001 that sets up, the, the, that makes the case for the need for critical zone science, also the need for field sites to work together to do multidisciplinary work in natural observatories. Our network of critical zone observatories now 17 years on uh, with something like over 120 million US dollars in investment in these types of sites. But I wanna focus in this circled statement of critical zone observatories is the first part that in addition, real progress will require problem-focused 
multidisciplinary field work. Um, and uh, across the, the, the critical zone observatories, the set of bullet points below the diagram note that this is an approach to Earth observation that's motivated by hypothesis testing. So it's driving forward science that can help solve problems. I wanted to just emphasize this notion of problem focus in addition to this, uh, these components of science agenda in the bulleted points. Um, there's another component about the research design of critical zone observatories, and that is about linking fundamental understanding, mechanistic understanding, even at molecular scale, through to planetary scale. Um, so many exemplars around, especially the USA critical zone observatory program of colleagues doing molecular physical sciences, molecular biological sciences, studying processes at grain scale within the soil profile and catchments, and uh, linked particularly with remote sensing techniques being to scale up information and understanding um, the basin and continental scale. So this notion of linking fundamental science and mechanistic linkages um, to sites at the scale of catchments and even up to continents, to me, is a very powerful a very powerful scientific methodology that we employ and aspire to employ uh, even ever more deeply in our critical zone observatories. And this capability uh, that of, of the observatory science that I've just uh, summarized in the last couple of slides then creates at our sites magnets for a wide range of disciplines, and certainly applied sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, biological sciences, but also, uh, particularly in when we are working in the interface of the policy arena, the sociological sciences, economics, management science come into play. And I'll give a little bit of an example of that uh, from my soil track project. And we know that this, this notion from 2001 of the critical zone being essential to sustaining or to um, uh, delivering life-sustaining resources is that we have these global societal challenges with our population growth and natural resource demand. Human use of the Earth's surface is putting these tremendous pressures uh, on Earth's critical zone with uh, the climate change uh, impacts, uh, the notion of managing land for food security, and that's linked, of course, to water that's available for agriculture. Um, the idea of our natural environment being polluted chemically and having impacts both on, on the uh, organisms of the environment, but also on human health and the interface of this natural environment with cities. So a wide range of global societal challenges, which are very pressing. And when I think of policy, now I'm not an expert on policy. I'm a, I'm a guy who worked on with test tubes and, and beakers and did things in the lab. And sometimes uh, colleagues like Tim would drag me out into the field and make me look at the, re the real world. I probably hadn't looked on it since I left the farm. Um, but policy is, is about the real world and how humans use the real world. And, and with all these societal challenges, I think of policy is, is the imperative of policy is asking the question to humanity, well, here we are in 2017, what's the plan? And our neoliberal uh, economics will tell us the market will solve the problem. When, when resources become scarce, we'll stop using them. Um, so we won't depend on them. We'll move on to other things. But of course, we understand from the natural environmental sciences, all of these issues of, of planetary limits and the, the costs of exploiting natural resources and the impacts uh, that can occur. But there are also many, besides this, this market value, which of course, if I think of farming alone, how we use the land is driven by our, our need for economic production to grow a crop that we can sell for money on the market. But we also know for critical zone science, there's a huge number of benefits to humanity, um, such as the potential benefit of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from land use. Uh, that's a tremendous benefit, but it's very hard for us to go out and sell that to somebody and put money in our own bank accounts. Um, and the costs, well, they're not directly 
incurred by the people who are um, emitting their, our greenhouse gases. Now, of course, carbon markets are being put in place to try to bring some market information into decisions about um, mitigating and emitting greenhouse gases. Um, so there's different ways to deal with these non-market issues, but policy is often trying to handle these non-market benefits and costs, trying to increase the benefits and reduce these costs um, through whatever, regulations, taxes, and so on. Um, so when the market fails, we have to rely on governments and also corporate policy to make and enforce rules that aren't strictly determined by decisions in markets. But it's also determined in policy by what's politically possible. Um, what's possible at the moment in the USA to do through the power of the office of the US EPA. What is possible to do today in Britain, uh, planning forward the prospect of Brexit, losing the potential of European legislation, but also in Europe, in command economies like China, in North Korea, they worry about pollution there too. What's politically possible to do about it there? But it's also in the private sector, what will shareholders and directors of companies, um, what, do their val what are their values and what will they permit in terms of corporate policy? Well, all of these things come together and making policy is, is not a rational process. It's messy, it's evolutionary. Um, arguments go back and forth. Uh, scientific evidence does play a role, but it's, it's often not a primary driver. It's often what is politically possible is a, is a key driver. When we're thinking of bringing scientific evidence from our profession into some of these rules of the game that make up policy, um, guiding us perhaps we should reduce our pollution emissions from contaminated land, we should reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from um, marginal land transition, converting native forests to cropland. Um, to bring science into this, you have to have, you start with a policy narrative. And the policy narrative is, is the idea of stories, particularly in the news or on social media that start to raise awareness of a topic and bring it into public discussion. Um, I picked out an example here from just in the last week, um, stories online in the New York Times about dust storms blanketing Beijing and Northern China. Uh, so Chinese cities experiencing tremendous loads of airborne dust, all the problems that brings, that starts to bring dust storms and thereby soil. And where is this dust coming from? Uh, is it desertification occurring in the northwest of China? Certainly that's a, a major source of airborne dust, and perhaps that's what's causing this. These types of discussions then begin to enter the public, public consciousness and in a large way. Um, but to make a difference, for this to reach the point where a government, such as in China, might decide to implement policy or regulations or measures to spread out across the country in order to reduce the incidence of dust storms or to protect soil from wind erosion, you have to move this topic from the policy narrative into the policy discourse. And for example, here, if we're talking about soil resources, we may want to consider uh, authoritative compilations of scientific, scientific information that's actually facing governments and decision-making bodies. And I show here the front cover of the 2015 report on status of the world's soil resources put together by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. So this policy discourse, this moves scientific evidence uh, and, and collates it, puts it together, starts to relate it to wider values such as protecting human health or protecting economic growth, and it links it to public and private institutions that can act. Uh, for example, the information that's in this report here, status of the world's soil resources, that information may, may be important for a company who's involved in agriculture to start to think about how they manage um, farmland. But it presents, presents evidence and it starts to create language and evidence for advocacy of the topic. In this case, uh, the area where my critical zone science has been most uh, primarily applied on soil resources, um, we would want to, to think of the scientific evidence and how to present this into deliberative bodies like legislatures that would help uh, policy units uh, start to think about 
solutions to problems. In this case, we could link this back if we think of the problem of, of dust storms in uh, major urban areas in China as the original, let's say, the news story that got the discussion rolling. So moving critical zone science into policy discourse, um, uh, this requires a choice of how we make this discourse. Um, what are the stories that we tell based on our scientific evidence? And so this immediately tells us that our science becomes also in this moving into policy discourse, it moves it into politics. It means that we can no longer, um, our science is no longer the, the, the purely rational uh, study that we uh, try hard to make uh, with our uh, presentation of our work to each other, our peer review decisions about the quality of the work, whether it can be published, whether it should be funded or not. It starts to move all of our scientific evidence into discussion and it will be influenced in the way that we present this scientific evidence. Um, we may have to find ways to tell this story that link the science to societal values and relevance, the impact and who is affected, or the consequences of inaction. And I'm going to go through some components of a policy narrative for soil and earth's critical zone that I use from time to time when I'm discussing with, for example, government agencies who are interested in in soil or water resources. So one of the points that I think is always important to make to people who are not scientists is to remind them that the earth is fragile. And I think in the last few weeks, the uh, small blue dot pictures that have been in the news from NASA are a great start to a policy narrative. Let's impress upon people that if you're at Saturn and you're looking at Earth, we are vulnerable. I tell colleagues uh, in government or in government agencies, Earth's critical zone is the only thing that stands between us and annihilation as we hurtle through this black vacuum of space. The critical zone is critical because it's what keeps us alive out here uh, in this environment uh, that we see from, uh, from the view of the, of the Cassini probe. Colleagues um, that I've presented to at scientific conferences, I'd like to give also an example of a policy narrative um, that was started by Professor John Beddington. He was the UK chief scientist in 2010, and he had a great uh, a great report and a public presentation of this at a, at a public meeting in the UK, emphasizing that humanity faces a perfect storm of converging challenges. When I heard his information, when I saw a recording of his talk and read the, the presentation, I thought immediately that this is, this is a really important story for critical zone science. He makes the point, and there's, he's done this in a couple of different um, frameworks, but in a, in a 2050 future horizon, he says that, note that the U.S. predicted, this was a 2010, the population will be over 9.3 million. There's a doubling demand for food and fuel and a more than 50% increase in demand for clean water. At the same time, the OECD was saying there'll be a quadrupling in the global economy. We're going to face all these challenges of demand while mitigating and adapting to impacts of global climate change. Climate change will just be biting exactly when these resource demands are really gonna hit. And we're already experiencing biodiversity decline around the world due to habitat destruction, particularly um, native vegetation uh, trans, uh, transition into farmland. But these projections, if we update these over the intervening six or seven years, as we now know our human population is Projections are closer to 10 billion. Greenhouse gas levels are exceeding previous records. CO2 is increasing faster than it has been over the last several years, and it's now we're routinely exceeding 400 ppm. And in the last ICPP report, the agricultural yields are they're actually projected to decrease overall globally over the next 40 years, years due to the projection of um, future distribution of, of rainfall and climatic conditions and weather patterns around the earth. And also the United Nations Environment Program, their uh, projections of food demand suggest that a productive land area feed the world by 2050 is 10 to 45% greater than the environmental capacity. So the point is that 
John Beddington started this discussion of the perfect storm. And in this decade, uh, this storm is growing in intensity. We are not reversing these trends yet. So some of the policy imperative that came out of these types of pressures on humanity have been the Sustainable Development Goals. The United Nations have um, reached agreement that there are um, 17 key goals that we want to move towards with certain timelines, uh, 2020, 2030, 2040, to check progression on these. And I think in terms of soil functions uh, within critical zone science, that there's a number of these, a subset of these, uh, some are more important than others, more directly relevant, but as a very high level policy aspiration, um, soil contributes directly, protecting soil resources, protecting water resources, uh, directly relates to, for example, uh, livelihoods of um, smallholder farmers around the world, eliminating hunger, providing clean water, um, life on land, and so on. So a number of these very high level policy markers set by United Nations, um, you know, intergovernmental agreement are directly relevant. Uh, and say, I would say critical zone science explicitly faces a number of these, these uh, policy goals. But these policy goals then move on into different types of instruments and international agreements. And these, these then cascade down into national policy. So I'm just going to run through quickly a few of these. One is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the, the current Paris Agreement. Uh, a number of, of countries have now ratified, 197 signed, um, putting forward voluntary but transparent nationally determined uh, emissions targets. And I think of critical zone science, particularly in the area where I work on soil, uh, soil carbon emissions and soil carbon sequestration that 25% of anthropogenic emissions currently arise from soil due to land use. For example, uh, native vegetation transitioning into agricultural land. There's the Convention on Biological Diversity that addresses three objectives, the conservation of diversity, sustainable use of biological resources and sharing of benefits, and critical zone architecture and function is central to sustaining habitat and genetic and functional diversity. And of course, the biological resources of soils alone within the critical zone, just within that part of the critical zone, are a hugely important uh, biological resource which we must uh, conserve. And so within the Convention on Biological Diversity, there's retrofitting um, by soil biologists in recent years to emphasize the importance of soil biology and the soil, the biological resources of soil within this convention. Um, there is this idea, I think, within biological diversity where critical zone science plays a particularly important role because our scientific community focuses on the architecture of the critical zone, atmospheric boundary layer down into the bedrock, and it emphasizes this, this architecture and this enormous vertical diversity and, and geophysical conditions and how this exerts radically different selection pressures on organisms between uh, those uh, in the atmosphere all the way down to those in the geosphere. And so I find critical zone this vertical diversity of habitat and our understanding of the, the physical and chemical environments and how that relates to the biodiversity of the critical zone as, as being an, an important and essential scientific contribution to, to thinking about how we use uh, biological resources worldwide. And finally, on land use, there's the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, which has this aspiration that we have net neutral land degradation. So if we're going to uh, tear up whatever, so many square miles of, uh, of uh, permanent grassland and turn that into uh, soybean production, then we've got to find the same amount of land um, and put that, uh, revegetate that, and put that back into, uh, restore that back into some semblance of uh, the type of, of um, land status that we are taking out, uh, that, we, that we are putting into uh, agricultural production. Uh, a good example here, and I show this, this uh, image across North Central Africa is this African Great Green Wall, which aims to restore 100 million hectares of currently degraded land here on the southern flank of the Sahara Desert 
sequester carbon and create a minimum of 350,000 jobs in rural areas. So that starts to show you, I think, ambition of employing um, land restoration, how this links to groundwater resources, how this links to carbon sequestration and carbon emissions to the atmosphere, clearly within the remit of critical zone science and, and how this can then impact both a large geographical region, but also many people in a positive way. So these international agreements that go into these conventions, these are uh, the signatory governments and you know, G, G7 governments sign up to these. Uh, these have to be implemented then if they're going to commit to this agreement they've signed up to into national policy. So the example I want to give is that in the UK, 0.7% of our gross domestic product must go into international development. Now this is actually becomes very important in this discussion of research and policy because in new programs going forward now, 1.5 billion pounds sterling is being allocated into research and development programs in association with our research councils. So this is doing critical zone science, other types of science as well. This might be medical science, it might be different areas of technology, but certainly in terms of environmental pressures, many of those are Millennium Development Goals. Um, this 1.5 billion um, can achieve a lot in terms of delivering great science that aligns with official development assistance for sustainable development, particularly in developing economies. So I think critical zone science is an essential integrating science for delivering this type of assistance, for delivering new knowledge that can be in incorporated into solutions to these global challenge. So one of the, the policies that came down into the European Commission was um, from uh, informed on, on land use and soil protection coming from some of these high level uh, UN conventions and, and agreements. And this was uh, articulated in a series of um, guidances, particularly uh, including research that's required, knowledge base that's required to protect soils. And this is about protecting soil ecosystem services or in parlance of, of, of my project, the soil functions um, that are at the heart of Earth's critical zone because these are so essential for within Europe, uh, they were seen as so essential to the ongoing success of, of, of the economy, to economic growth as well as environmental protection, um, climate change mitigation and so on. So biomass production, filtering water, uh, especially uh, contamination of soil, transforming nutrients, making them bioavailable again, um, carbon storage for climate regulation, biological habitat, and maintaining gene pool. And this is set out in a series of policy documents from about 10 years ago. But this policy of the EC also drove a, an imperative for, for new research. And we uh, put together a research project that talked about within this soil layer at the Earth's surface the connectedness of the critical zone, that soil then, because of its central role as an interface and a source and a sink uh, with the atmosphere, and with the geosphere, with surface waters, with vegetation, that soil is, is not only important for what happens within soil, but soil becomes a very central control point within the critical zone for influencing what happens elsewhere. Composition of the atmosphere, um, mitigating, protecting, uh, uh, water quality and aquifers, maintaining base flow to rivers, and so on. So if we can get our soil functions right and protect those, that provides a great mechanism to gain many other uh, added benefits for the environment, including the market benefits of, for example, food production, but also the non-market benefits of, of having a clean environment, protecting human health, and sustaining um, future natural resources for, for future generations. The point of departure for us scientifically was the idea of soil structure. I just show this with a water retention curve for soil to as a as one quantitative representation or, or, or manifestation of the internal pore structure of soil, but also the fact that from agronomy we know that um, soil structure, the pore architecture within the soil column, within the soil mass, correlates with a tremendous number 
of um, characteristics of soil, including the fertility of soil for agricultural production, draining soil, water retention within larger particles for, uh, for plant available water, so to protect against drought stress, uh, and many other positive factors. So if we can create and build and protect soil structure, uh, from our point of view, uh, it gave us a scientific point of departure for, for soil protection and that could help inform policy. And we looked at conceptual models for building soil aggregates, for building soil structure. The idea that we take here, this gray blob representing particular organic matter in a kind of typical conceptual model that's in, invoked now for soil aggregate formation. Fresh organic matter enters the soil as litter. Um, comminuted by soil fauna, fresh source of carbon and energy for heterotrophic microorganisms, which colonize the surface um, as this uh, surface growth continues. Um, there's exopolymers, which also help bind additional particles together, help the surface colonies of microbes thrive, um, maintain water within these colonies and so on. Um, driving the buildup of aggregates and that as the organic, fresh organic matter is decomposed, uh, then you lose this biological functioning, the microbes die off, these particles break up back into the soil textural units. So the idea that building soil aggregates, we know uh, empirically, you know, it's a, a classical story, feeding soil with organic matter helps improve soil structure. So if we can continue to feed soil organic matter, we can continue to build aggregates which correlate with all of these positive, positively with all of these important soil functions, including fertility. So we translate that conceptual model uh, into a, a simplified version, plant litter entering uh, several class sizes of soil, um, both soil textural units, or silt, clay, and sand sized particles, and how those then, the smaller sizes can aggregate within larger aggregates and the flows of carbon that help drive these processes. So the decomposable plant litter uh, driving the formation of large particles, recalcitrant aromatic um, um, organic matter, particularly that which is stabilized by the organomineral complexes on, on the uh, mineral surfaces of the, the nanooxides and nanoclays helps protect it. So we think of carbon, which ends up in this smaller size fraction is protected carbon. And the carbon, which ends up in these larger size fractions, is driving rapid biological turnover and release of um, organic nitrogen and phosphorus plant available, so improving soil fertility, correlating with the formation of these large aggregates. So we think in simple terms, if we want to sequester carbon, we want it as the stabilized organomineral complexes. If we want to improve soil fertility, we need rapid turnover of degradable carbon, releasing nitrogen and phosphorus back for plant productivity. And we can put this type of a, of a model and a mass balance and mass action equations that uh, uh, describe this aggregation processes into uh, flux and mass balance representations of the soil profile. So we can conceptualize a soil profile as a soil reactor and uh, write the relevant flux balance and mass balance equations and the uh, transformation rate laws that correspond to the geochemical processes, the dynamics of soil aggregation, the water flow, solute particle transport, and so on, and, and end up with a, a 1D reactive transport model for soil conceptualized as a biogeochemical reactor. We applied this type of model at several sites of uh, the four European critical zone observatories. I'm going to show just a few results to illustrate um, this type of modeling approach. And this was um, results from the group of Nick Nicolaides uh, at the Technical University of Crete and the site that he leads uh, on Crete. So Crete, uh, a 25 kilometer distance from the coast near where this picture was taken to a, 2000, a more than 2,000 meter high ridge on the spine of Crete. So very, very steep topography going from coast up to um, uh, you know, deep snowpack in the winter uh, on the mountains. And we looked at uh, 
some of the tests that we did with this type of modeling approach were with experiments where we did soil carbon amendments, um, looking at horticulture plots. Uh, these are tomato experiments with conventional fertilizers with manure and a mixture of manure and green waste, just uh, vegetation waste um, from gardening waste from the, the nearby city and look at the, the behavior of the soil under these different treatments. And we couple then a series of process models together that can describe a range of processes, the flow and transport, uh, mineral dissolution. CAST is a new subcode that we wrote, which quantifies through uh, phenomenological mass action, kinetic mass action laws, the dynamics of soil aggregate formation and breakup, a dynamic vegetation model, um, chemical equilibrium, including sorption and ion exchange reactions, and um, into a, a time step algorithm with a transport being represented uh, in 1D vertical dimension with our, uh, precipitation entering the top of the soil carbon and drainage leaving the bottom. So we can look at soil organic carbon over, this is a 10 year simulation horizon, and we uh, do a typical sort of optimization technique to try to get our parameter sets to uh, fix as many as possible from independent numbers. The ones that we don't have first principles uh, evidence are the mass, uh, the kinetic mass action rate constants for soil aggregation uh, and soil aggregate breakup. So those are fitted parameters and we then test this fit against uh, these are uh, the yellow lines are the soil organic carbon in the uh, clay size aggregate fractions. The gray is the silt size fractions and the, the gold is the sand size fractions. Um, and we look as well at the distribution of the mass percentage of our different uh, aggregate size fractions. So water stable aggregates, so just a, a size classification. Um, calculation within the, the modeling code of uh, soil structure as defined by the mass distribution of water stable aggregates, silt, uh, clay silt and sand size, but also the distribution of plant organic carbon as it is um, calculated by the vegetation dynamics model. And there's a, a range of plant physiological uh, parameters that are returned as well. Um, we can look at how this tests this against observations, the symbols being the measurements, and how this works for the four treatments of the biological production of the carbon, um, how the soil organic carbon content changes in the different size fractions for the different treatments, the fact that our organic amendments, as expected as you amend this carbon, it builds it up in the soil, but also the dynamics of soil structure within the four treatments. And uh, one of the lessons we learned out of this is not only uh, how important soil structure is for all these soil functions that we need policy uh, to protect, um, but also how dynamic soil structure is, that there's an intense seasonal dynamic to soil structure, as well as long-term trends as we change land use or change organic carbon content soils. And uh, we had as well then at the policy interface to translate these soil functions into uh, monetized value using a number of uh, you know, standard methods of valuing, placing, uh, uh, monetizing non-market value. And I want to emphasize that these are in international dollars, uh, biomass production, the filtering function of soil to remove in particular nitrate from runoff and recharge and climate regulation by storing carbon is that these values we're not claiming that this has a tradable market value, but it gives information about the relative importance in a common currency, literally, in this case, international dollars. We're not advocating that you put prices on these soil functions, but we are advocating um, that it gives a way to try to compare non-market value with market value and think about what are the relative importance of other soil functions such as protecting water quality compared to the more marketable soil functions such as producing uh, 
crops and, and feeding livestock. And you'll note that the climate regulation numbers are negative, so these are costs, and these uh, reflect the fact that this site is uh, undergoing loss of soil organic matter and desertification. Um, in interest of time, I won't cover the, the geospatial uh, variation of these values, but it's just to emphasize that these are based on, on model calculations carried out at different points in the catchment along with soils data, and that together you can uh, construct geospatial maps of the value of specific soil functions. Our message to the European Commission on this was that soil does a lot of things besides grow food. It helps regulate climate. It helps protect water quality. If we protect water quality, then our utilities don't have to pay to remove contamination from clean sources of natural waters. Uh, there's a cost then to consumers and so on, and that some of these monetization calculations are sometimes very useful uh, in policy discussions of emphasizing that there are the non-market impacts of that there are environmental, there's environmental value, environmental benefits to many people and environmental costs. And we can bring this thinking into the policy discourse in one area where this has come into the policy discourse was in the UNEP yearbook 2012, their emerging issues chapter on benefits of soil carbon, where it was emphasized this integrating role of soil with their Earth's critical zone um, and the fact that there is a connectivity between soil and how we treat soil to what happens with vegetation, what happens with atmosphere and climate, what happens to the geosphere, what happens to groundwater and surface water resources. So we can see critical zone science entering some uh, being introduced in, in a limited way in some, some of the policy arenas and some policy discourse. There was an international workshop at the University of Delaware in 2011, and, and at that time, the participating scientists and, and colleagues who sent in information compiled a set of sites around the world that were um, you know, ongoing or candidate critical zone observatories. Um, uh, it emphasizes that, that there was, um, I think if I go back to this slide, it, it emphasizes that in Europe and North America, there was ongoing research already at that time. I'm emphasizing that in terms of global societal challenges, we see relatively little activity in the global south and relatively little activity within this part of the world of China, which is this uh, major economy, uh, major demand of resource, and a major uh, impact um, on on, ha on the the footprint uh, of on the food market um, and uh, the demand from a large population on a number of resources. So we can say there's a starting point going back several years. We can see that a large part of the the, the Earth is, is not represented in terms of geographical spread of critical zone observatory activity. Um, there was crosstalk at all times with between other funders, not only NSF, but with NERC in the UK, with the National Science Foundation of China, with DFG in Germany, CNRS and Author in France. And uh, jointly, these funders convened a, a workshop in China, which pulled together scientists, uh, a number from the US, French, German programs were there and uh, looked through this governance of partnerships to move towards greater integration. Now, one of the consequences for that that was important, um, in my view, in terms of international critical zone science is that it, it brought in a number of sites. These are the sites of the Chinese Ecological Research Network and brought in uh, a tremendous range of um, great scientific expertise and a well-resourced and, and strongly studied uh, site um, within China, which then began to give um, you know, a broader geographical representation um, into the, the critical zone science community. 
And one of the consequences and outcomes of, of these discussions and, and working between Chinese and UK science was the establishment of a joint UK-China CZO in, in our UK parlance CZO program. And there were five projects funded. I'm involved in one on peri-urban agriculture. And um, uh, in terms of the policy interface, I want to emphasize that these funded projects, this is some of this money that was released from our Department of International Development in the UK. So this is some of the 1.5 billion that is released to support R&D for global societal challenges. So with these projects, we have to deliver official development assistance outcomes in addition to our usual ambitions to publish in science and nature, to get an additional uh, 10 million in funding on the back of the initial project, et cetera, et cetera, that we, we all work towards collectively and individually in our research. So these projects um, have to deliver also some changes on the ground and the things within my project on peri-urban agriculture that we're doing is we're helping to reduce, uh, provide science evidence to meet China's policy objectives to reduce the dependence of agriculture production on mineral fertilizers, particularly the greenhouse gas uh, mitigation potential, the carbon footprint of the Haber-Bosch process um, scaled up to the amount of fertilizer that's used in China. Doing experiments with farmers, looking at ways to improve yield potential using organic fertilizers rather than mineral fertilizers. Um, helping to develop agricultural pra practices which uh, maintain soil fertility but protect water and provide safe crops without uh, chemical contamination, for example, uh, arriving with organic fertilizers and improving practices for um, processing organic waste streams um, into organic fertilizers, into commercial products, um, and using this in, in, a, in a scaled up um, agricultural practices, uh, which could be a, an alternative to relying solely on mineral fertilizer, and developing the Peri Urban Critical Zone Observatory as an international test bed around sustainable agriculture and the urban pressures on that agricultural catchment. And of course, to build the durable and productive strategic partnerships that, that link Europe and China into uh, doing great science together in the future and working together on these global challenges. Um, and uh, these types of discussions continue, but I want to emphasize that in this discussion, the, the critical zone science agenda has a distinctly policy-oriented flavor that when we were discussing 18 months ago potential future areas of the next generation of funding for the UK and China to work together, that things like urban-rural transitions and their urban rural interface, ecosystem restoration, and sustainable intensification of agriculture were identified as areas of policy pull. And this is where I talk about there is knowledge push. We have great ideas as scientists. We get our ideas funded. We deliver the great ideas. Those uh, are collated with many, many sets of results. And some of those things then contribute to all kinds of innovation. Some of them lead to IP and influence uh, commercial and policy practice down the line, but there's also an area where there's an intense demand from policy for science, and so critical zone science in China and the UK in these discussions has huge policy pull. There is a huge demand for the type of integrating science that our scientific community does to deliver solutions to some of these societal challenges that have been identified in this case for the UK and China. So our awareness of the critical zone observatories and critical zone science in the policy discourse is low, other than a few examples that I've given. So uh, if we want to increase our visibility and our potential for funding to do great science, one way is to make it more policy relevant, but that means a more concerted effort to bring our science into the policy discourse. Uh, it's the potential, though, is there. To me, it's it's one of the great the great opportunities of critical zone science and and things that we're doing already across all of our national programs are delivering great science that is uh, helping to solve these societal challenges. And I want to emphasize that there are large funding streams now that are moving from international development 
into international development linked to doing excellent research. But there are many challenge areas and many geographical gaps in critical zone science, particularly in the global south. And certainly at my university in Leeds, we look more and more for opportunities to partner with science partners in the global south, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where we can harness the types of science that um, in both sides of this north-south uh, group of scientists, the kind of science we want to do, but also that helps um, provide solutions for this policy pull of soil, water resources, biodiversity, sustainable agriculture, land use transitions, all of these things which contribute to the solutions to these big global challenges. So I want to end on a really positive note. The critical zone observatories are really well positioned to deliver against policy imperatives of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and these types of UN conventions. And these are embedded within our national policy. And our funders, NSF, Research Councils of the UK, NSF China, and others um, uh, have uh, then a role to play in, in delivering science evidence to meet these, these policy goals. And that is the end of my presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, we went a little long, but if anyone has a quick comment or question, um, please feel free to unmute yourself. Steve, it's Tim. Um, so I, I have a lot of things we could talk about, but uh, the first one, or the, what I'm given the time, what I'm going to ask is where you ended just then. Um, you know, I, so how? I mean, specifically, how would, let's say, a PI from one of the observatories in the U.S. make some sort of scientific result really um, digestible and put in front of someone, for example, in the United Nations in a way that could, that could lead to some policy? I think uh, as, uh, the PIs, API would need to be proactive in seeking out a willing discussion partner in the policy arena. And there will be people within the United Nations. Um, there, there will be uh, people in many different policy units and national level that would welcome that dialogue. And so I think it is identifying um, partners. So if, you, if your university or your national lab uh, has a policy uh, unit or a department uh, that acts on environmental policy, go and talk to them. Find out who they work with in the policy arena and begin that way. Well, that sounds like really good advice. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty obvious. Any and other? I think, and I think that what I find is when I articulate critical zone science and the integrating and interdisciplinary nature of critical zone science, the policy people who are looking for science evidence to help them solve problems like food production, climate change, etc., they get excited. It's a community. They understand instinctively because of the comp they understand the complexity of the policy challenge. And they understand that part of the policy, the complexity of the solution, yes, of course, it's politics, but part of it is because things like soil and aquifers and river basins are not trivial to understand and manage. And so to find a scientific community where there's a lot of crosstalk and that is comfortable having many disciplines working together at a particular river basin they, I think, instinctively understand this is a community which can help them. I'm going to ask you another question, which is more just an, an opinion. But you know, you you mentioned briefly uh, the EP, the US EPA, and you know, at least those of us in the US are aware of some of the challenges we may be facing with our new administration in the environmental realm. And I'm just curious, 
uh, what your opinion is on it, um, if, if the U.S. community wanted to move forward with some sort of, with, you know, with, with some sort of effort to influence policy, uh, would, would we want to work through our federal government or given the atmosphere, go to the UN and, and try to do it internationally, of course, facing the backlash? I, okay, I think some of the most enlightened policy thinkers right now are in large multinationals. Uh, you'll notice that Rex Tillerson has resistance at least it's, in, it's stated that he has, he's cautioning the current administration in the U.S. not to abandon the Paris Agreement. It's better to be at the table. And his background, of course, is in um, multinational hydrocarbon uh, industry. When I talk to colleagues who work, uh, for example, we work on hydrocarbon contamination of aquifers with um, uh, European shell uh, colleagues or uh, colleagues from uh, you know, any of the large hydrocarbon companies, they are very enlightened. They understand also the corporate responsibility and they understand the corporate reputational risk to not get it. And they also understand the real financial risk of changing weather patterns and changing climate and they want to protect their companies against those risks. And I think there, where I think there is a, a, a powerful advocacy now and uh, currently worldwide is by working, trying to find, gain access and discussion with scientific advisors and technical advisors and senior technical people working on these problems within large multinational companies. And they, um, they get this, I, I, they get this. They, they have a very strong understanding of the sustainability agenda and their boards, they are articulating this clearly to their boards. And, and I think many of these companies at board level and at shareholder level too uh, are worried. And so I think one way forward is for research excellence that we represent out of our universities and national labs to seek a partnership in this area with the, the technical people and scientific people um, and, the, and the corporate responsibility people of large companies. Uh, have that discussion about how can critical zone science help how can access to our broad scientific community help them? I think, again, they may well welcome that. So to go in and have a discussion, be it with the UN or with any government around the world, uh, that discussion would be much easier if you go in shoulder to shoulder with uh, a very highly clued in business sector, in addition to um, you know, the very, very active you know, policy-facing NGOs who are trying to deliver, deliver international aid and, and such things. Those, those organizations are still there and are always looking for scientific participation in their work. Um, but I would think, I, I, I'm certain that one path forward is engaging, is doing some research, finding out who are the enlightened companies and seeking to discuss with them. You know, that sounds like a great response and good advice again. I, that makes a lot of sense. Any other questions? Now's the time. Well, Steve, thank you for closing out our spring 2017 webinar series. And again, all of you, um, stay tuned for a fall series. Thanks for participating. And Tim, I can just add thanks again to everyone. And if anybody has comments they want to pick up with me individually, 
I'm happy to pick that up via email with anyone. Thank you. See ya. Thanks, Steve. Thanks.